Sometimes our worst fears are things we will never encounter. Ghosts, ghouls, aliens. But for others, their worst fears are available on demand for a fee. And for some, they just can't get enough. If you're looking for a fright scarier and more intense than anything you can imagine, it's out there. This week's episode is Extreme Haunted Houses. Fills with dread, probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister who? Happy birthday. Oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> that was so millennial sounding. <laughs> I'm drinking a pumpkin spice latte. Oh right now. my gosh. <laughs> I'm on TikTok right now. Oh my god, I am on TikTok and accidentally I remember talking to you about TikTok <laughs> on first, Saturday. The first video I uploaded on accident. I, I mean, I just I uploaded it on purpose, but there's like 102,000 views. And I was like, oh, that's just every video. And then I've uploaded a bunch after that. And it's like 25 views. And I was like, apparently the first one was a I hit. don't have an account. Probably wouldn't understand how to use it, quite frankly. <laughs> but I enjoy watching when people repost funny animal videos yes. that happen on TikTok. That is a TikTok subset. Honestly, I can barely keep up with Twitter and Instagram. I don't think I need to introduce another platform into my there's life. A, yeah, there's a lot out there. There's yeah, a lot of content. There, are. Lot there of content. are. There are. There are. But is there a lot of content or is it all the same content well, just recycled on 8,000 different platforms? That's a good question. It's a lot of content, does it, but it doesn't mean it's good. Yeah. It's a uh, quality over quantity get does not at, apply to social media. That is accurate. Some people on TikTok will be like, hey, guys, I'm about to dye my hair orange. Check back in 24 hours. And I'll show you. I'm like, God damn it. This is <laughs> they'll like do teasers. And then sometimes they don't do an update. It's very annoying. So then you're you never see the orange hair. No, they, I think they do that. So they why go, don't they do a video of them dyeing their hair? Well, they do it. So or they'll sh show like, oh, here I am with the hair dye on. Like, what will it look like? Come back tomorrow. And I think they do it so they'll get followers. So people are like, oh, I should follow them so I can remember to come back. But why does anybody care? Usually it's something they're doing something dumb like, oh, I'm going to dye my hair green or do whatever. I'm going to drink 50 gallons of milk. You just That's, like that will kill you. <laughs> Can't you die from drinking too much on, milk? Yeah, on Jackass, they drink a bunch. They did. In, Those idiots I think nearly was, did die all the time. They may have been eggnog because I think they were doing like Cool Hand yes. Luke where they ate all the eggs. And they, when he snorted the wasabi, <laughs> I accidentally did that one time eating sushi and thought I was going to die. For How a aggressively second. were you eating sushi? Very aggressively. <laughs> it, it, I think I coughed or something while I was eating it and it like went, you know, like uh -huh. so everything's connected. Yeah. It went like up into my nose. I don't, I mean, it was a scene. It was, it was a scene. Were the authorities called? Uh, I know, they should, maybe should have been. I had to spit everything out into a napkin. I was oh. with people. It was embarrassing. Oh, horrifying. Yeah. It Uncontrollable was... coughs are like, that happened in IHOP the other day. We had gone out. Where had we been? Oh, it was after the live show. We went to, Paris and I went to IHOP and I, uh, too aggressively it was chomping on a turkey bacon and it mm. went down it was I had a dangler so it was like a long enough piece that it dangled down into my swallowing hole but it was tickling my, my breathing hole mm. and I just started coughing so bad to try to get it out and Paris up. no but I was coughing and like my eyes were watering it was so embarrassing and Paris just <laughs> kept going he may have had some beverages and he kept going you're the best thing that ever happened to me please don't die please don't die please don't die <laughs> okay <laughs> dramatic it was very dramatic I loved it I Accid I sometimes will uh, get this thing when I'm at funerals no. where I start caught like I get a tickle in my throat no. and I'll start like coughing uncontrollably. I, I think it's one of those things where I know this is the worst place that this could happen. Yeah. And so it does. No. It's always a fear. I, I'll take. A bottle of water with me to you a funeral, should. just you in case it happened. Did I tell you when I got trapped in that funeral? It was probably about a yes. year ago, and I was in the back pew, and I felt a rumbling. And yeah, I had to go, and you're tumbling. But it was in the crematorium part, so there it's just all you know, rows and walls and walls of the boxes with the ashes and remains in them. So I ran down the wrong hallway while the, the funeral was going on to try to find a bathroom. I found a plant and I considered it, but mm. did not. And then I went. 
I had to go cross back through the funeral and I found the bathroom, which was literally adjacent to touching, touching the place where the actual funeral was happening while someone was singing Amazing Grace. They stopped and I was like dying so much. <laughs> it was so loud. And then they, st- I didn't want to flush it because someone was then talking and crying. And I knew if I flushed it, you would hear them be like, and then Uncle Marvin will go to heaven. <laughs> Ah, who who designed this funeral home? And so I stood in like the doorway of the bathroom because I was like, okay, as soon as everyone gets up to go out, I'll I'll go in and flush it. But before it was over, this lady came and was like, I need to go in there. And I was like, no, you can't. And she started trying to push me out of the way. So I had to push her out of the way, close the door, flush it anyway. Did you open the door while your poo poo was in the toilet? Well, I closed the lid of the toilet, but I didn't want to flush it. But why did you go out of the bathroom? I said, that's a good question. <laughs> I would never have abandoned my poop. I didn't abandon it. I was just walked away from it for a minute. Well, if you walk away from your cart in the grocery store, you haven't abandoned it. If you have the intention to return, if I had not- shit in my cart, I wouldn't have walked away from it. <laughs> I would make because there's no well, telling really, what's gonna. You what, can't shit gonna- in a cart, can you? You would just go everywhere. Oh yeah, it'd go right out yikes. those little holes. Yikes, man! Speaking of yikes, what? This topic. Oh, God. Yeah, speaking of bodily fluids and excrement. <laughs> who? There's, um, I'll tell you what I didn't get you for your birthday. Okay. And yeah. it's a ticket to an extreme Any, haunted house. Because I would not go. I wouldn't get you a ticket to a regular haunted I've house. I've never been to a, a real haunted house. I did a walkthrough at Six Flags Great America. I and thought you went to one where your mom dumped a that drink was like on a kid. A... That was a hell house at a Catholic church. Oh, okay. This was in Great America while I was in college. So before I went to law school, and a guy in a penitentiary orange jumpsuit with a hockey mask it was really mixing up the the horror yeah. film tropes because then he had he's a taking chainsaw. Some liberties. <laughs> so he had a chainsaw. Oh, so he, okay, he's hitting all the tropes and a wig, like a long slash kind of Guns and Roses wig. Oh. And he was coming at me with the chainsaw, and I just stood and yelled at him. If you hit me with that chainsaw, I will be able to sue Six Flags because the ticket does not allow you to touch me. Oh, God. He just rolls his eyes under that hockey mask said, and he's like, all also, right, lady. You will be personally liable for your injuries to me. And he was like, all right. He just moved on. They don't have chains on him. No, but it was scary because when he would hit it it's on loud, the, yeah. the concrete, it would spark. Mm. It was very scary. Well, you definitely would not like the haunted houses we're going to be discussing no. today. I actually got really scared reading about these, which is stupid because they're not real. <laughs> Well, the that's interesting. The fear is real. Yeah. So it's that thing, like I've talked about before, where that I discuss with my therapist a lot. Your brain doesn't understand True. if something's real or not. So you have the in same those physique. moments, you have the same physiological response as you would if, if it was real or fake. But people are doing these extreme haunts because they want to feel what a what it would be like if you were really in a situation like you're about to get your head blown off or you're getting sexually assaulted or you're being buried alive, but you're in a, quote, controlled, safe environment where you probably won't die. (laughs) And some of them. But there's, in my research, no one has died yet. Correct. People have been injured. I And someone had a heart attack. Yes. I I think that um that'll be the next thing that happens and yeah. then some stuff's going to stuff's going to change. Yes. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And in honor of Halloween, this will come out the day before Halloween. Yes. We are doing this week's episode on extreme haunts. There are a lot out there. We focused on 3 that kind of give you a different variety. Oh man. The whole time I was reading about all these, I kept thinking, would I do this? Yeah, would you do it? You're so brave. You would do it. I, I wouldn't do McKamey Manor. For sure. With a gun to my head, which they will pull on you. God. But, um, the first one we're going to talk about, Blackout, maybe. I, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Let's, I, let's describe them, and at the end of each description- I'll, I'll say, would I do this? Will they, won't they? Okay, okay. okay. All right. I'm going to say, you won't on all of them already. <laughs> Accurate. Well, let's get into it. Created by Josh Randall and Christian Thor in 2009, Blackout, located in New York City, is considered to be the first extreme haunt to come on the scene. 
With backgrounds in avant-garde theater and running Vortex Theater Company in New York, the two men knew that they wanted the haunted house they created to fit with their artistic aesthetic. In an interview with Ranker, the men said they wanted a haunted house where There were no monsters, vampires, very little makeup. The whole goal is to create an effective experience of fear, which is subjective. We don't try to be scary as much as be effective. This is more about performance art rather than ghosts and goblins. You have to say ghosts and goblins with such disdain, <laughs> sir. Well, well, when you asked me earlier, how does the written intro look? And I read... Some people will never encounter things like aliens. I said, well, that's pretty. Some well, people who's have. To, who's to say we're not going to encounter our worst fear of aliens? That's true. Although also not my worst fear. Would love to encounter an alien. <laughs> a nice alien. Not, not an alien like from alien. Not where they do butt stuff. Alien like E.T. alien. Yeah, oh, E.T. God. doesn't do butt stuff. I'll start crying. <laughs> oh, God. E.T. No, E.T. would never do butt not stuff. Not with that big long finger. No. It's fucked up. <laughs> be terrible that way it's the red dot on the end et touch butt <laughs> like no et we don't do that no et we don't sit down <laughs> et Eat put, your reese's pieces et you put sweet put reese's little angel. Piece in butt. well unlike traditional haunted houses where huddled groups of friends cling to each other for safety and support as they make their way through dark rooms filled with bloody monsters and chainsaw wielding clowns blackout requires that the guest go through alone Mm -mm. so this is genius in my opinion oh yeah i think you can't really experience that type of fear that you're looking for if this is your thing if someone else is there well true and because usually in a group of people going through a haunted house i imagine you have a good jokester who's like oh it's not real or a tough guy people laugh when they're uncomfortable or a tough guy and so the other people could ruin your if you're like i'm a true believer i want to like suspend disbelief and be into this they could kind of ruin it yeah that's a good point too well in addition all patrons must sign a waiver and as the blackout website states those that enter will encounter fog strobe lights loud sounds complete darkness crawling kneeling stairs mild restraint water sexual and violent situations and aggressive physical contact if at any point the experience becomes too intense or terrifying Participants can yell the safe word, safety, as loud as they can, and an actor will immediately escort them out of the house. Those that tap out will not be refunded the $65 entrance fee. So it comes down to me if I, like, somebody asked me if I do the 72-ounce steak challenge. Yeah, if I have money on the table, I'll do stuff. <laughs> so if you sixty five is not enough, sixty five, that's not enough. I don't think it's enough. How, how, how six hundred and fifty? Six hundred and fifty is a lot. Yeah, that's a lot of. You dollars. would continue probably for a hundred bucks. I'd probably do. It. You would continue through it. Yeah, probably. Mm. I guess now you just learned my cutoff points. Hundred bucks. That's I, a lot of money. I think. Um, I think even for a hundred bucks, and I say this with the most love. That you would tap out. I wouldn't even go in. I'm a baby. <laughs> I I'm a think, huge baby. Because I, I was reading about this this haunted house. I was reading about Blackout at DCH at the picnic table. And Taylor Rex wrote, our friend walked up behind me to say hi. And she didn't even go, boo. She just went, hey, Heather. And I went, ah! <laughs> and I screamed at her. And then maybe 10 minutes later, Donald, who works at DCH, came up to ask me if I needed anything. And I went, ah! <laughs> and he goes, just because you were in that mind I frame of it. being scared? Because I was reading what we're about to get to. And I was just so into it and yeah. i was so scared and so even reading about it i screamed at people i can't i'm not going in. i'm a huge baby. i think even going in you're like a hundred dollars of course i'll do this but when you feel like you're honestly going to die mm-hmm. there isn't any I amount of money no, i'm saying you in the general sense oh, if, if people are that scared yeah that they honestly feel like they're going to die. I don't think people in Blackout feel that as much as some of the other ones we'll get to. That's true. This one I, I have a lot of respect for. It seems very well done. And it is more avant-garde and more theatrical mm-hmm. than some of the others. While the theme of Blackout changes each year, a few things seem to remain the same. The set is minimalistic, inspired by the urban decay patrons are surrounded by in their everyday life. The floor of the haunt is concrete or linoleum, and often littered with items one might find on a city street or parking garage, like dirty discarded tennis shoes, broken glass, and even used condoms. This intentional blurring of lines between a fantasy world and one that participants encounter in their normal day-to-day further enhances the psychological mind games. Yeah, it seems like it's very realistically set up, so you just feel like you're... It's not like, oh, you're in... Dr. Frankenstein's right. laboratory. You're like, you're in a back alley right behind the building. You're like, oh, God. Yeah. It's, it's, it's situations where then when you find yourself 
in an area in your real life mm-hmm. that kind of resembles this, you're like, there's going to be a lot of psychological mind fuck happening. It's true. It's going to come all rush back to you. Yes. Over the years, participants of blackout have reported being bound, gagged, waterboarded, suffocated, and having experienced simulations of sexual assault and rape. I read one blog girl, one girl that blogged about it, and she said that they had her lay down and someone came up behind her and was like breathing on her neck and was like, what do you want to do next? And I was like, ah, you get the fuck out of here. <laughs> what do you want to do next? Punch you in the face. Yeah, there's. There's a lot of nudity in this one. So what did that one person on Reddit say? If you don't like wieners, blackout's not for you. <laughs> yeah, I think I have that down here. The people that do blackout say they have the nudity because if someone's in a mask or a costume, there's this barrier between the two of you. But if somebody's fully stripped down to their most vulnerable state, then that's even scarier because you're like, this is just like raw this person at their this real person coming at me are they flipping out yeah you can't pretend that it's like a, a monster of some sort no it's just a real naked dude it's just a guy doing you. helicopter dig <laughs> yeah yeah there's a lot of insinuated sexual violence that goes on in this one which for some is a thing that they like That's... that they'll pay pay money to be a part of yikes Steve Green, a reporter for IndieWire, experienced a lightened version of Blackout while attending the Sundance Film Festival. In his article, I Survived the Most Terrifying Experience at Sundance 2016, Green recounts how he entered a dark room with a staircase located towards the back. At the top loomed an ominous figure, beckoning Green to climb up. The masked man then sternly asked if Green suffered from conditions such as asthma, epilepsy, or PTSD. When Green answered no, he was shoved into another dark room, illuminated only by the TV monitors lining the wall. After donning soundproof headphones, a video of a teenage girl began to play. The girl instructed Green to yell, I am prepared to be marked. Before Green could barely get the words out of his mouth, a plastic bag was pulled over his head and he was dragged to the next room. So this is more of a like a storyline that you're participating in. It is, yes. And... They kind of change the themes from year to year. People say that some are more um, like cult based. A lot of the Mm. tactics they use feel like things that are used in a cult um, or the military, like Mm. um, psychological torture and things like that. The bag over the head would that might send me into panic mode i don't want anything over my head. Also, here's the thing. I, I was having a conversation about strip clubs the other day and I was like, I'm not morally opposed to strip clubs because of the nudity. I don't want a stranger to touch and sweat on me. That sounds like that's my nightmare. Yeah, yeah. I don't want someone getting their face in my face. I don't like being touched. I did not like, and I do not as an adult, but like as a college kid, did not like going to clubs because people are just manhandling each other. I don't want to be touched. I hate it. These people will touch you. No. For sure. No. But a lot of like average haunted houses, that's a rule where they can't touch you. They can't touch you. Those rules do not apply in the extreme Not in the blackout. With his head still covered in a plastic bag, Green then had a small bottle thrust into his hand by a man known only as the Instructor. The bottle's contents, temporarily unknown, the Instructor then whispered in Green's ear, Open it only when you need to. Suddenly, another voice screamed in Green's ear, Find the girl! before ripping the bag off his head, shoving him to the ground, and demanding he crawl on all fours. I'm tapping out. I got bad knees. (laughs) Dude, mine too. (laughs) Mine have been so bad lately. I think it's the weather. I was just talking to Tommy about this. He's like, you need to walk more. (laughs) I'm like, I walk every day. Do you think I have a little hoverboard I ride around to get to Stop using your Segway, Chrissy. (laughs) Not all of us have Segways. Oh, man. If, if I, had, I had a segue, I would fall off of it every sure. every chance I got. I can't even ride those damn little scooters around. You've seen me try to ride one of those. <laughs> I ran into a brick wall. <laughs> they they those things are death I love, traps. I love scooting. Oh my god! If I could change one thing about this city, just burn them all. Not the crime, the scooters. <laughs> I would throw them all into a pit and light them on fire. I think they're little death traps. They're very dangerous. Yeah, I saw a dude that had just fallen off one the other day. That his head was just gushing blood. Yeah. And he was waiting for an Uber to come pick him up to go to the hospital. <laughs> and he was dressed in a suit. Like yeah. he was, it was during lunchtime. He was mm-hmm. downtown and he'd just been scooting somewhere and just my, 
busted it. Like our office is on a corner of two really busy streets in Uptown and you see dudes like loafers, khakis, polos, scooting hard and fast. And I'm like, Craig, Chad, Thad, who are you? on a helmet. Never. They'll mess up their hair. That's what I'm saying. It's just so dangerous. And kids do it. They're all over the place. They're on the sidewalks. It's also just dangerous to be walking down the sidewalk and nearly get ran over by a scooter. We're officially old because we're like, these damn kids on their oh, scooters. Man. My knees are hurting. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want anybody touching me. <laughs> we are. We're old. How old are you? 33 today? I just turned 33. The same age that Jesus was. That's right. And several celebrities, I think, die at 33 is the thing. Yeah, that's true. Kurt Cobain. Well, it's whole, go time. There's a whole it's nice knowing you guys. Fuck. Oh, I hope you don't get put into that category. I hope not. Well, in almost complete darkness, Green made his way on his hands and knees across the floor, terrified and unsure of what was going to happen next. It was then he noticed an area of the room bathed in red light, illuminating a young girl huddled in the corner, a black cloth bag covering her head. Fighting his body's instinct to run, Green crawled over to the girl, nervously removed the bag, and asked her, What do you need? Unable to speak, the girl instead doubled over in pain, writhing around and convulsing. Remembering the instructor's words, Open it only when you need to. Green then gave the sickly girl the contents of the bottle some pills she frantically swallowed. Once the pills quelled whatever was ailing the girl, she then took Green by the hand and led him to a bathroom. Once inside, it became clear the girl was not out of the woods as she once again began to convulse. She then had Green face the wall. This creeps me out because of Blair Witch. What's that? Oh, face the wall? At the end, yeah, when they'd always have them face the wall before they, before they would get killed. Ugh. And then at the end of Blair Witch, spoiler, it came out like 15 years so ago. Many, so many years ago. He's standing against the wall at the end of the found footage video, and then the guy filming gets clunked on the head and the camera goes sideways. That image still gives me cheer. Something about like an empty room and somebody standing against the wall mm-hmm. in a corner just really freaks me out. It, it's uh, of like, what what are they looking at? Why are they turned around? With a pounding heart and a voice in his head telling him not to turn around for fear of what might be facing him, Green obeyed the girl. She then once again took his hand, but this time did not lead him out of the room. Instead, she guided it up the inside of her leg to a string hanging there, presumably the root of her pain. Wrapping Green's fingers around the string, she then urgently demanded he... Pull! Pull hard! Green did as he was told. Okay. It's not comfortable to pull your own tampon out, much less a frightened stranger. Well, this is apparently a thing many have reported having to do in this haunt. Taking them down to tampon town. (laughs) And then putting them in their mouth. Putting the tampon in the victim's mouth? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He doesn't mention... He doesn't give all the details, (laughs) but I'm willing to bet he was forced to suck on it right after he did that. (laughs) Suck on it like a milk dud. That that uh that's the thing that a lot of people have had to do. Even if the actress is not on her period, it's not real. There's cooter juice on it. Where do you think? No, she it's not it? really on her inner badge. You don't think? So? Hell no. That's that's no, not in a million years. It's taped to the inside of her leg. That's why they haven't faced the wall, so you can't really see what's happening. Or maybe she, or she it just hands hand. it to She's him. Yeah, it in yeah. Her hand. It did not come out of her poos <laughs> not at all <laughs> fully fully believe that it did. i'm not no even way. in the haunted house no 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 but it's that that uh, disbelief where yeah. it could i just thought man and that's what's scary or well, disgusting that's what well, i just also was scary thinking this poor girl every day before work she she's got to shove a tampon <laughs> Got another one. Oh God, I gotta shove this tampon. You guys buy the fucking paper applicator yeah, tampon. She gets paid extra. I hope they give her the pearl with the, the <laughs> yes. nice plastic, not some paper. cardboard big ass super absorbent one. <laughs> that's like the size of your fist, shoving it up in there. God, dry like a roll of bounty paper God. towels. <sighs> Tampons are the worst, They're man. Some the necessary evil sometimes. I mean, once a month for four to five days, <laughs> they're a necessary evil. It's true. I have never used a, a diva cup. I have not either. A friend of mine got a diva cup. Stuck up in her? Sucked to her, whatever, cervix or uterus, whatever part. I don't know my got, vagina well enough. It got, stuck, it got stuck, stuck up in there? Her sweet, sweet husband helped her get it out. Oh, That's true love. Man, I can count on one hand the time amount of times I've gone to a doctor because I thought I had a tampon stuck inside me. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. 
That's worrisome. Never once have I. But you worry about it. You read those horror stories. Yes. The toxic shock surgically syndrome. Surgically removed and stuff. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine was recommending a disc where it's like a circle thing that you bend in half, put it up there and go boing, 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 boing. And it's, I don't <laughs> How know. How does if, it catch the stuff? It's like, a, it, it's like a trampoline and the goo goes on oh, the top of the trampoline. let's not call it goo. <laughs> of all the things I've read so far, that was the grossest. Okay. Really? <laughs> Uh, and so then you, you can take, you take it out and like throw it out or I guess, I think so you it's can, like a diva cup. Yeah. But instead of suctioning up, it lays flat. Okay. Huh. Interesting. Like a trampoline. Yeah. I've never tried one. I've heard good and bad things mm-hmm. about them. I'm a klutz. I'm, I would, whoa. And there would, it would be splash city, <laughs> splash zone at sea world. It'd be awful. Man, this is turning into a real, these haunts have changed us. We've, I read so much disgusting stuff. Yeah. And now we're just, it's just rolling off the tongue. It's, uh, and you know what? It's my birthday. I'll say goo if I want to. Okay. Well, there you go. Shoved, pushed, pulled, and thrown about. Green then found himself in yet another room, face to face again with the instructor, who was this time yelling, What are the numbers? There were four numbers. What were they? While a second actor forced water down Green's throat. Well, that's just trying to keep him hydrated. I don't think it's, it's simulating drown. Mm-hmm. So the plastic bag and the water are two things that would possibly keep me out of this haunt mm-hmm. definitely the water i don't want to f- ever feel like i'm drowning that's already a fear of mine so have you ever almost drowned yeah where were you do you want to talk about it um yeah i mean did i really almost drown i felt like i was going to that's fair. i was snorkeling and i was probably like eight or nine mm-hmm. i was snorkeling with my dad and we were swimming out to this where were we hilton head I don't remember where we were. To go there. It's gorgeous. I don't remember if that's where we were. He kind of took off. And so, <laughs> and I started panicking because mm. it got really deep all of a sudden. And I went to stand on a huge thing of coral and ripped my Ooh. damn feet up. And then I started panicking more. And he was far away and couldn't see me. And this little girl I'd befriended over the course of our vacation was around and she came out and grabbed me and pulled me back to shore. Oh, that's so nice. I know. But it was terrifying in that moment because the water is already, you're at a disadvantage, I mm-hmm. feel, because it's just not your home territory. Yeah. Anything you encounter in the water, a shark or anything like that, they, eels. Yeah. They, oh, eels. They've Yikes. got your number. Yeah. So even though, again, like it's that I could die from this. Yes. Because at the end of the day, these are just people. Yeah. These aren't medically trained professionals that have some, you know, training as to, okay, they've had enough. Now they might, these are just people that enjoy is, doing haunted houses. He's just squeezing an Ozarka bottle yeah. in your throat. He could have an oopsie. Yeah, absolutely. And you or, don't want to be on the other end of that. No. While Green doesn't provide all the gory details of his experience, leaving the reader's imagination to fill in the terrifying and disturbing gaps, he does give insight on how the nightmare came to an end with another plastic bag shoved over his head while being told to scream, It's never over! Before abruptly being shoved out a door that dumped him right back on the same street he had been standing on a half hour earlier. So I think this is pretty effective scare tactic because you're in a facility that's designed to look like the outside streets kind of and look like kind of street garbage and and then they stick the bag on your head to disorient you and kick your ass out a door that you're like, Oh, maybe I'm going into another room. And he said he like took a big breath and took the bag off his head and was like, Oh... I guess it's uh, I'm out. There's no there's no warning Mm -mm. like in a regular haunted house. And like a lot of haunted houses have those foam things you go through at the end Mm -hmm. to kind of like orient you back to Mm -mm. being happy or whatever. No. And that's one reason this haunt is effective is because you have no time to come down from Mm -hmm. what you just experienced before you're immediately thrust back into your real life world. And he said they would just sneak up behind you. So then you're like out on the street and you're like. Are they, is there somebody, am I going to get? Yeah. 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 People for months Mm -hmm. will be looking over their shoulder and affected by it, but they love it and they go back for more. Addicted. According to Green, the use of perpetual motion was used throughout the haunted house, meaning your sense of stability is rocked as you're whisked from one room to the other. This creates a sense of chaos and makes it impossible to get your bearings about you in any one room before being thrust into another. All of this adds to the psychological torture fiends of blackout crave. Despite creating complete mental chaos and exhaustion, blackout has garnered itself a group of superfans who return to the house over and over again. 
These super fans were the subject of a documentary released in 2016 titled The Blackout Experiment, which interviewed the repeat participants as to why they keep coming back. We all live once. One man in the documentary says, I guess we all want to do something that is risk taking or scary. I guess we do. That's a long way to go. YOLO. <laughs> I was going to watch this documentary and I read the reviews and they're not good. <laughs> I just watched a bunch of clips of it. Everyone was like, this is boring as hell. Uh, <laughs> nothing happens. The scenes in the actual haunted house are so dark. You can't tell what's happening. Yeah. And it was like, it's just a bunch of talking head interviews. I, was saying, I just watched the to- like the talking head interviews to get pull quotes and just kind of get a, a sense of what's going on in these folks' heads. Well, several of the subjects in the documentary who refer to themselves as survivors say they have had real life struggles with neglect, isolation, substance abuse and sexual violence. For these individuals, blackout has helped them confront their past issues and abuse and allowed them to feel a sense of empowerment. One survivor even said, I believe that blackout has actually transformed me. And that's the thing that I've seen in in my research of doing this is for some people, it is this therapeutic way to process trauma that they've experienced in a different way. Hmm. I think I am the opposite, maybe, and trauma I've experienced would cause me to freak out and panic in a More. situation like this. I think I would, too. And just want to get out of me. I think I'd probably faint. Like, I'd pass out pretty easily. I think I'd probably just, like... I think I'd have a panic out. attack yeah. and scream the safe word. Yeah. So, but, but my, some people, and that's, but that's really interesting, fascinating to me from a psychological standpoint, how that helps some process something like that in a different way. I guess like maybe like immersion or yeah, something. Yeah. Or it just helps them process the trauma in a different way. It's like very interesting. Re experiencing that adrenaline rush and then coming out okay on the other yeah. end, like over and over that you're like, oh, I can go through this horrible thing and be okay. Then if you have a flashback, I guess, to the traumatic thing, you're like, oh, I can be okay. Yeah. If you've conquered something that maybe happened to you in real life in this situation Mm -hmm. and survived it, then it gives you a sense maybe that you survived it in your real life, too. That makes sense. I mean, my new thing is let people enjoy stuff. If you want to go and black out a million times, you do you, man. It's about 25 or 30 minutes. I don't think it's mm-hmm. like yeah. super unreasonable. No, no, no. If you want a helicopter dick coming at you, screaming at you, whatever, <laughs> you, you pay your $65 and you do, do it. it. One guy that I watched in a documentary, the uh, it was called uh, Haunters, the Art of the Scare on Netflix. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. One guy that came out of Blackout, they interviewed, and he said something to the effect of, I got to do things in there that I've always dreamed of, but that would in my marriage and put me in jail. And that to me is where it gets problematic because this guy and many others, these are fetishes and fantasies for them. And when you get people like that going through something where intentionally the lines of reality and fantasy have been blurred, you could just be a step away from crossing over and doing stuff like that in your real life snatching people up off the streets for real or sexually assaulting them for that purpose yeah yeah Yeah. so i think that for some people it does Mm -hmm. seem like it scratches that itch that of things that they know are taboo and illegal but this gives them an environment in which they can do it it sounds like a kurt vonnegut story you know it's like where you can like go into a place and do anything you want to do that probably is a story but that's wild yeah so I all right know. will they won't they blackout oh man i'm i'm curious oh you're blackout curious i am blackout curious i did look up if they still had dates available do they they do Ooh. <laughs> um but i <sighs> i'm not gonna fly to new york this week and do it no it runs through november 2nd it runs i believe this it was like the fall kind yeah of. it's it was like beginning of october to the first week in november and tickets anywhere depending on the day are like 65 to 70 bucks and you make an, a reservation online depending on the time you want and show sign that waiver show up you have to Go through with a flashlight they provide you mm-hmm. and a surgical mask that you wear. Okay. I also don't think it's wise to wear glasses mm, because it seems they like just you're get whipped, ripped off. Well, you're yeah. whipped around a little bit. But 
I don't know. I'm curious. I don't know how curious. Interesting. Would you, won't you? Um, under no circumstances. <laughs> My thing is, I would be afraid I would like freak out and punch someone and get thrown out, like get in trouble. You would immediately get Like thrown I just out. would be like, Ugh, get away from me. Cause I'd literally like, if you, it happened to me in an improv scene, someone came up and like put their hand on my shoulder and I didn't hit them. Actually, Tommy was my teacher and I was like, uh, 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 and Tommy had to say, is this Heather the character or Heather the human being? And I was like, Heather the human being. And he was like, okay, don't touch her. And like, they just had to know you cannot sneak up behind me and put your hands on my shoulder. I will panic. I'll freak out. And so is that from your sister scaring you so much as a kid? I'm not going to blame this all on Shannon, but 100 percent. That's what this is. No, I don't think it was. I think it. I don't know. I'm just I'm real jumpy. I'm real antsy. And anything that, you know, like past my ears, you you can't see out of my peripheral. My reaction is to like, (laughs) yes, I'm exactly like a pig. Pig. I don't mean that in a negative way. No, pedal pigs aren't like pigs. Eyes are so forward facing. That they can't see out of the peripheral and therefore, like, even if you go to pet them on their side, they will, like, Just, snap at you and get yes. upset. So you I have am, to go at them from the front. I'm maybe, like a dog. That's probably why you love me so much because I'm so similar to Pedal. <laughs> yes, I, I know snort to pet and, you from the front. I snort and breathe heavily. You do. I get startled if you touch my hide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're real stubborn and don't want to come out of the yard. But if there's treats involved, we I got to spray you with the hose to get you in the house. <laughs> that's right. Please. It is very humane. We do not like douse her. Mom, I told you. Just got to turn on the sprinkler for a second to get her ass in there. I told you on the last episode. My mom used to spray me in the face yeah, to wake me up. She's it's, fine. That's perfectly fine. All right. Well, next one. This one. Um, this one's interesting to me. Los Angeles based heretic run by a husband and wife duo who go by the names Adrian Marcato, a shout out to Rosemary's baby, and Jessica Murder. Provide one of a kind, terrifying experiences for their customers who gladly pay the hundred and fifty dollar fee to be the star of their own horror movie. In a 2018 article published by the New York Times, Marcado recalls how he decided to get into the extreme horror business in 2013 after hosting a rather macabre event at his house. One of Marcado's friends had recently been murdered, and in a bizarre and dark tribute to her. Marcado reenacted her death at his home for some of their friends. According to Marcado, Everyone that came through was completely terrified and loved it. I thought we should just continue doing this and see what happens. What do you feel about this? When I read this, I, my jaw dropped. That's pretty wild. I feel like... I mean, we don't know her. We don't know him. Maybe that was something they had discussed or he felt like she would have... Maybe she was the type of person that would have loved something like that. On the one hand, you want to say people can process their grief. And if he's a performance artist and that's how he could process his grief better, maybe that's good for him. But I would feel really bad if her family wasn't involved or aware of it. If yeah. you're then kind of acting out her murder and just kind of uh-uh. like you it's, said, maybe she weird. knew about it or not knew about it. But maybe she they discussed it or kind of made a comment or he just knew her personally so well yeah. to know that she would be okay with him grieving that way. But uh, wouldn't, um, wouldn't be for me. Please don't do it. If if Same. I ever get murdered, please do not read it. Agreed. <laughs> Murder please. at your home for please. anyone. Please. Well, Marcado, an aspiring filmmaker, enjoys pushing the boundaries of his clients' emotional and psychological limits. Past haunts have included burying people alive, pushing them off balconies onto hidden airbags below and convincing patrons he was going to light their heads on fire. According to Marcato, Everybody calls a safe word on that. He prides himself on each show being unique, allowing for customers to experience a new form of terror each time. Yeah, you think that setting fire to someone's face, is that's what throws them off? I would think so. I wonder, it is interesting again, though. I mean, yes, of course, that's the most heightened, horrifying thing that could happen. But what in your head makes you think, oh, this is actually for real? Yeah. Like, I know you that suspension of disbelief that this is all just for entertainment value. I've paid to do this. We're basically on the set of a movie. Somehow goes out the window. People die on sets of movies. I got <laughs> really... True. One night, it was like right when Paris and I started dating, and he texted me at like... He got out of a class at like 1 or 2 a.m. and texted me like, hey... I hope you'll probably get this in the morning. I just want to say goodnight. And I said, actually, I'm awake reading about how someone died on the set of the Twilight Zone movie. And he was like, cool. <laughs> and like, uh, the lead, uh, Jason Lee? Oh, Brandon Lee. Brandon Lee, yeah. 
Yes, but like the and the Brandon Lee, the crow thing was wholly an accident as far as like the gun dislodging. Right. But the set of the the I keep saying Zodiac, the Twilight Zone movie that was like John Landis was being negligent. We should do an episode mm. on that because the the helicopter pilot's like, we can't do that, and he's like, keep going lower, lower. It's gonna look so crazy. They're gonna get so scared, and then look, like there was a huge accident, and people died. The so, helicopter crashed. Yes, it killed Ooh. the the two child actors and a guy on board. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was there was a huge lawsuit. Is like a big deal, but like this, you know, doing something that seems like that's a helicopter swooping down and it seems dangerous, but it's all just for a movie. There's no nothing to be afraid of. Like. We're just burying you alive or pushing you off a balcony or we're going to light your head on fire. Again, accidents happen. But it's exactly if he pushes you on the the, off the balcony and you land on the airbag on your neck and you're paralyzed or you die. That is still scary. And in their waiver, it also says death is a possibility. Yeah. Assumption on the risk. We'll get into that later. I mean, the waiver at DCH also says that. (laughs) That's just a good waiver. I think it's pretty standard. It's a good waiver. Well, John Granillo, a veteran scare actor of 15 years, says working for Mercado and Heretic has been the most filling job he's ever had, specifically because Mercado allows him the freedom to decide the best way to scare the participants. I scope them out in the dark and I see how they move and I decide if I should grab them from the behind, from underneath, from on top. Granillo said in an interview with The New York Times, he went on to say, The only rules are don't kill them and don't physically scar them. This is a person that likes gravity grabs. <laughs> He's a gravity guy. Yeah. I mean, scare actors in that documentary I watched, that's a big thing. I've even, I went down a rabbit hole today of scare actors. It's a, it's a huge thing that people get very into and pride themselves on. And I think, and we'll get into it later, people that seek out that kind of career are a special breed unto themselves as well. Let people enjoy stuff. I mean... Let people enjoy stuff uh, to a degree. <laughs> it's true. And I think it, the enjoying I mean, stuff, some people enjoy... Uh, if it harms uh, others. <laughs> doing some real fucked up well, stuff. It's kind we of don't like, want them to do that. You know, we say, oh, it's our freedom of religion or whatever. And you're free to practice stuff as long as it doesn't harm other people, right? Which is what they're doing. But... It doesn't harm them because people have consented to it. You know what I mean? That's what, yeah. The yeah. difference is they've consented. They're not going around, you know, hopefully he's not going around grabbing people from behind or underneath on the streets. While many can't imagine paying hard earned money to be put in such stressful, intense and horrifying situations, others find it therapeutic. Suchata Juntarakawi, a 41 year old casino accountant, is such a devout fan of heretic. She had the company's logo tattooed on her arm. Suchata, who struggles with anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts, has found the immersive experience the haunt offers allows her a unique way of working through her issues. Other participants have said it gives them a sense of self-pride that they were able to complete it without tapping out and allows them to feel alive in a way they never previously have. Well, that's understandable. The, The example I read of a guy that went through this, he, you're in a field with probably like eight to ten other people that are waiting for this to happen again you do this alone you're suddenly kidnapped thrown into the back of a van driven to another location where you're then thrown out into the the field and basically told that aliens or monsters or something are around and you have to get to this tent and it's this whole storyline again to save them and then various things happen while you're doing this but you're i mean he's the women were in sports bras and like boy shorts and the guys were in boxers and you're getting shoved into the dirt water dumped on top of you i mean very physically uh and aggressively touched and everything so it's definitely not for the faint of heart but again for adrenaline junkies who want something different it's it scratches an itch maybe up their alley all right well they won't they heretic i i feel like i might do man i don't i don't want to be physically hurt Mm -hmm. so i don't know i feel like this one might be a little more physical than blackout Mm mm-hmm I like to be scared. I don't want to be punched in the face. Or pushed off a balcony. Or feel like, I don't know, that kind of intrigues me. Oh, God. (laughs) 
I mean, if I know I'm going to be okay, I've always said I want to be on scare tactics. I don't even think that show exists anymore. First of all, bring back scare tactics. <laughs> Second of all, put Christy on the show. <laughs> but I, th- I, I would want to be a scare actor on scare tactics. That'd be fun too. Like if they had a secret camera on us and I was like, oh my God, there's something in the attic. And then you're like, oh, what? And there was something in the attic. Yeah, that would be fun. See, but because it, I'm curious what it would feel like to feel that way and then be completely okay. Mm-hmm. I don't want to feel that way and not be okay. True. But that's, I think, what these people are craving. They want to feel, they want to get as close to the edge of death as they can, knowing that they're not going to really die. That, but experience what that feels like. Well, considered the most disturbing, disgusting, and psychologically and physically torturous extreme haunt is McCamey Manor. Formerly located in San Diego, McCamey Manor, owned and operated by evil mastermind Russ McCamey, now has two locations in Summertown, Tennessee and Huntsville, Alabama. In the 2017 documentary Haunters, The Art of the Scare, Russ talks about how his love of experiencing haunted houses as a kid with his dad coupled with his natural ability to entertain and 23 years experience in the military, led him into the haunt industry. Videos of him make me so uncomfortable. He's a nut. (laughs) Is that why he makes you uncomfortable? I think he's got this like wily look behind his eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, anyone that does what he does uh, is has to be unhinged to a degree. I mean, it's yeah, it's just that look behind his eye. He just makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. He's got kind of like a used car salesman look about him, <laughs> but coupled with someone who would you don't want to be alone with in a dark alley. Yeah, just almost like a he's a loose cannon. Yeah, he's very loose cannon. Very loose cannon. Well, the price to experience what is quite literally a living nightmare is just a big bag of dog food, which Russ, a self-proclaimed animal lover, then donates to Operation Greyhound. However, before participants need to worry about deciding between Alpo or Priorina, there is a laundry list of requirements they must meet in order to be accepted to the manor. All contestants, as the manor calls them, must be 21 years old or 18 to 20 with parental consent. They must pass a background test, as well as a pre-screening interview with Russ via Skype and a second interview with another staff member. Anyone who enters the haunt must have proof of medical insurance, have completed a sports physical, and provide a letter from their doctor stating they are physically and mentally cleared to participate. Those that make it this far must then pass an on-site drug test prior to the start of their experience and sign a detailed 40-page waiver. Can you imagine that conversation with a doctor? Like, I'm sorry, you need to know for what? <laughs> oh, I'm going to be, they're going to put my head in a box of bees and smash my hand with hammers? Oh, well, I, okay, here you I go. I don't see why your head couldn't be stung <laughs> yeah, by bees. Yeah, I mean... Uh, you do seem physically fit to encounter such a thing. Okay. Yeah, this waiver. Whew. The waiver, which many consider to be illegal and a violation of human rights, has participants agree to allowing the actors in the haunt to physically and emotionally harm them, bury them alive, waterboard them, force feed them rotten food and various live bugs, and a myriad of other unimaginable torture. Most importantly for Russ and his team, by signing the waiver... All participants waive their right to sue McCamey Manor, regardless of what happens to them, including death. People were throwing around this violation of human rights online. What they really mean is against public policy, right? Do we want to have a? Do we want to live in a society where a person's allowed to do this freely with no repercussions? Well, according to you, let people do whatever they want. Let to people do. enjoy stuff. I, I read it. I don't think it's uh, all of it is illegal. I think that there are parts that maybe are unenforceable, but it's very, it's detailed, man. It takes five hours for the people to sign it. It's detailed. Well, until recently, McCamey Manor did not have a safe word. Participants could scream when they were unable to stand the torture any longer. The only way victims were allowed to exit the manor early was if Russ decided that they were physically or mentally unable to continue. That's what you want is you want that guy to decide. And he just he doesn't give any. He's a loose cannon. (laughs) However, participants are now required to come up with a safe phrase prior to the start of their tour. If at any time during the haunt they say they want to quit and repeat the safe phrase, their tour will end. What would be your safe phrase? Well, he gives it to them. Oh, you don't get to pick? No. It says they're now required to come up with a safe phrase prior to the start. They get to come up with part of it, but they are. it's basically a a version of uh, mine would be like, my name is Christy Wallace. I traveled all the way from Dallas, Texas to McCamey Manor to hang out with Russ. 
and to disappoint him and my family by quitting. McKamey Manor took my lunch money and it's something like drank my milk and took my lunch money. And it's and then like some things are added in that are personal. Like I could be like, I disappointed my husband. My husband, Tommy's here. I made him drive me all the way here. I'm a disappointment to him. Let me just say, Tommy would never be disappointed in you. <laughs> Thank you. Mine would be, hoochie mama. Like, <laughs> but so, yeah, that's, yeah. But that's, now, I mean, after but see, that's they've a come trap. under fire for a lot of things. So they had to issue a, a safe word. But for me is if you're like getting waterboarded and you're like, my name is Christy blah, 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 Wallace and I want to blah, blah, blah. Well, like, how would you even get it out? You uh, on all the countless videos I've watched Ugh. of everyone quit, they all are getting waterboarded saying, I'm done. I quit. I'm done. Blah, 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 blah. And then finally he'll say, all right, say the phrase. And then they stop and let them do it. But it's not like they say I quit and everything stops. Right no, away. no, no. Because you're gonna- it goes on for qu- for several more minutes. And he definitely tries to convince and persuade you to stay in it. And before they had the safe word, if you watch any video on YouTube that happened like 2014 and before, they didn't have one. Mm -hmm. And people, it is so uncomfortable and upsetting to watch these people that literally think they're dying, begging for their lives. And they're just laughing at them and continuing to dump water or to, to slam the, hold their head in a freezing bucket of disgusting dirty ice cold water or uh feed them roaches or whatever it's it's wild it's really uncomfortable there are millions of views on every single one. Oh yeah so it scratches an itch it's, for it viewers. scratches a lot of itches for a lot of viewers yes well, unlike other extreme haunts, everything that a person goes through while in McCamey Manor is filmed by Russ, edited into what he calls movies, and then uploaded to his YouTube channel. In fact, upon moving to his new location in Summertown, Russ now requires all contestants to watch a mandatory three and a half hour long movie that consists of edited together footage of every participant that has attempted to complete the Summertown Manor and failed. He says he wants anyone that is crazy enough to attempt the manor to be completely aware of what they are getting themselves into. Another reminder of the manor's catchphrase, you don't want to do this. It's just a way to get people to watch a three and a half hour crappy movie. It's so ridiculous. I mean, I tried to watch it. The first 30 minutes is him with um, like a head camera on facing him while he walks down to get his mail because he lives on this <laughs> huge property in the middle of tennessee he's got like 20 fucking dogs so i gotta go down to the mailbox the val packs in there this week and i gotta get a coupon to golden corral he, yeah he's he's walking down and he's talking about it and stuff and then it's everyone that has tried to go through the manor for the past two years when they quit which is everyone that's tried to go mm-hmm. through so it's just a lot of edited together people saying they're safe things. So it gets kind of just repetitive and boring. That but is torture in and of itself. He says that because they've come under such fire over the past 12 years, that's why they have a safe word now. That's why he watch, makes people watch this because so many people leave and try to sue him or say all these things happen. And he wants everyone to know this happens here. This isn't, we're not just blowing smoke up your ass. There's a good chance we shove you in a pool with uh, 30 eels in an 80 foot deep deprivation tank, or we hypnotize you into thinking a great white shark is swimming around you. These are all things that have happened. Like he's, he's fucking nuts. Mm -hmm. He uses his military training, which he admits to of psychological torture in, in this. Mm -hmm. So he's very effective at what he does. Mm Mm-hmm. And he wants people to know what they're getting into. Still, people think it couldn't be that bad. Everyone that shows up and tries to do it, it's like, I saw the videos. I thought I could be brave and do it. When you've got somebody trying to yank your tooth out with a freaking rusty plier, tell me you're not going to say uh, a, a tap out. No, thank you. Yeah, it's it's wild. These videos are... Not for the faint of heart, and they are wild. Yeah, well, I, yeah. That being said, I've kind of become obsessed with watching them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm one of those three million views. 
So why would anyone want to do this? A quick search on YouTube of what past participants have experienced would make most people run for the hills. But with a waiting list of 27,000 people, McKamey Manor is obviously providing a desired service, albeit a dark and twisted one. 27,000 people are waiting to get into this. I just feel like it's almost like you it's people want to tell people that they did it. You know what I mean? Like some oh, do. No one is ever. I'm going to do it. I'm stronger than that. And then that's exactly the type of people they want. And they're going to pull oh, your yeah. teeth out, man. He breaks everyone. He's going to pull your teeth out. I I've read ne- the waiver. There's a lot. I've of stuff never on seen there. him actually pull someone's tooth out, but there's a lot of threatening to do it. He also is very clear with the people because he's very like friendly with them and jovial and joking around. Even while it's going on, he's kind of like Laughing. on your side and like, yeah, he's just kind of this like weird, lovable character in a way. You're becoming obsessed with Russ <laughs> I'm worried. I have been obsessed with him. When when we first started doing the show, I remember going down this rabbit hole and saying to you, one day we're going to have to do an episode on McKamey Manor. Well, contestants typically give the same reasons for wanting to go through, to see what they're made of, to push their bodies to the limits, to experience pure, raw fear. However, to date, no one has been able to make it through the entire 10 hours of brutal and nightmarish torture the manor inflicts. Everyone has said the safe phrase. Rusnock claims that if anyone can make it all the way through, he will personally hand them a check for $20,000. Easy way to make quick 20 G's, baby. That's what I'm saying. So that's a lot of money. No one, even with that dangling in front of them, people, your body shuts down. Yeah. I've seen videos. One of the most disturbing was this guy that they had to stop it because he completely blacked out. Just eyes glossed over, had no idea who he was. And all he kept saying was, I think I died. I think I died. Am I am I dead? And he, it was he and his brother doing it. And they finally, like, they stopped everything, got him warmed up and stuff. And he's like, I don't even know what happened. I don't know where I am. I blacked out. Your body cannot handle that kind of stress and mm-hmm. fear. It's fight or flight. And you you just mentally break down. And that's what they're designed to do. They they are breaking you down psychologically and mentally. And that's a scar that takes a long time to heal. If ever. If ever. Yes. People come out of this saying for months they were em- emotionally tormented by what they went through. Oh, my God. This is one not in a million years I would ever do. Man. But even with $20,000, after 30 minutes, people tap out because they just – you don't realize – how fucked up what happens there really is until you're there. A typical tour of the manor consists of the following. You don your adult-sized cartoon onesie that all participants are required to wear. You are then handed the 40-page waiver to read through and sign. This waiver ceremony takes five hours, and the abuse has already begun. Scare actors punch you in the head, slap you in the face, douse you in fake blood, and shove dirty rags in your mouth. As this is happening, Russ films, taunting you and asking you why you would ever agree to do this. As you are shoved face first in the dirt and slapped around, you say, I don't know. But you still sign the waiver. With paperwork out of the way, the real fun begins. The same actors that have been abusing you thus far now aggressively wrap duct tape around your head, sealing your eyes completely shut. Maybe a plastic bag is pulled over your head. More duct tape sealing it closed around your neck. You're then picked up and thrown into the back of a van. Next thing you know, you're being yanked out of the van, dragged across the hard, cold ground as your kicking and screaming is mocked. You're 20 minutes into a 10-hour hellish nightmare. What's his face? The uh, dark tourist guy? David Ferrier. Gorgeous. Perfect. Love him. Bless his heart, though. I mean, watching him go through the little mini version. He tapped out after he... Well, the waiver ceremony was five hours long, which he says, this is torture in itself. (laughs) And then the the stuff started, and within 10 minutes, he had mm-hmm. tapped out before they even got in the van. Mm-hmm. And the other guy that was not a friend of his, just someone else on the show that was doing it, stayed in, got to the location, and within 30 minutes had tapped out because he was being dunked underwater and told to and hold his breath for 30 seconds. They'd yank him back up. They're like, that was 25, and just yank and shove him back dirty down. dirty water. 
Yeah, and this you isn't feel like, like you're a drowning. swimming pool. This is like no, sludge. you're. It's like you're in a, the set of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I mean, it's filthy. It's and it covered says in on the disgusting on the stuff. waiver, it says you will be exposed to raw sewage. Yeah, yeah. They may, they're made to shove their hands in and gross ass toilets and all sorts of stuff. Once in the manor, which consists of a bunch of rooms on McCamey's property filled with barbaric homemade torture devices, contestants are forced to wear metal cages around their head while wet mud is shoveled on their face and body, a simulation of what it would feel like to be buried alive. Many are strapped to tables, their wrists and ankles immobile, while live cockroaches are shoved into their mouth and dumped all over their body. For those that vomit, actors pick it up and feed it back to the victim. This is also in the waiver that you'll be fed your own vomit and be exposed to, and there's like 30 bugs listed that they may... From what I've seen... They haven't done anything that they don't flat out say in the waiver. This could happen. I mean, so if you read through this waiver and they don't read through it, they have to read it out loud to us on film. So he has all of this document. I mean, he covers his ass for sure. You know that this could happen. If you sign that waiver, you can't be surprised when then you're fed a live cockroach or covered in them and covered in them. One girl said she left with cockroach bites all over her body i didn't even know they could bite you Ugh. that's fucking horrifying but it says in there that you'll be exposed yeah. to these bugs and they bite everything things. that we're talking about people sign off on i'm saying it doesn't just generally say it's violence no it's like, it's we will put very a, descriptive we will put a box of it's bees. 40 pages long i just love that it says we will put a box of bees on your head yeah <laughs> that's very specific. and they will and a lot of people that i watch these videos of read it and say nah and they tap out before they even can get to the after the signing of the waiver. If somebody slapped me in my face while I was trying to read, I'd be like, I am out of here. Y'all slap yeah. me in my face. I, Keep the one guy food. didn't even get out of his car. <laughs> he quit because he, just like he was like the feeling of dread and terror. I, this is so intense already. Rest and came walking started. up to your car. I'd fucking beep, peel yeah. out too. Shit. Some have reported being forced to lie in a closed coffin, complete with live tarantulas and cockroaches. Just when they thought it couldn't get any worse, an unknown gas is pumped into the coffin. Others are forced to lie down in a rusty cage that is so cramped it presses into their face. Freezing cold water is then dumped on top of them, making the contestants certain they are drowning. And while all this is going on, five to seven people are screaming in your face, pulling your hair, slapping you around, hitting you with various objects, and documenting everything with a camera. It says in there you may be subjected to carbon monoxide poisoning due to the fog that's pumped on your face. I mean, it's all, it's just, it's listed. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's it's all in there. The rusty cage, that that part, Mm. uh, that's one that... Because I'm claustrophobic Mm -hmm. and anything where something is wrapped so tightly around my Mm -hmm. head that it's like pressing on me and they're just like laying down in filthy water with it's like a crab fisherman's cage, Mm -hmm. you know, that you see on like lobster boats and stuff. One of those just that they're encased in pressed down against their face, their whole body. Well, in the cold water, I don't even put my hand in a thing of ice to get ice out. I got to have a scoop. Got to go cup, scoop. <laughs> yeah. I don't want ice water poured on my face. I got chills just it's hearing you say just it. It's not just ice water. It's filthy, disgusting, Doo- foul-smelling gutter Doo- water. Doo-doo water. It might have doo-doo in it. Yeah. Well, it's easy to see why no one has finished the manor and why some have tried to seek legal action against Ross and his team for emotional and physical damage. As reported by Ranker, haunt survivor Amy Milligan claims that the uploaded video of her experience from the San Diego location was grossly edited and purposely doesn't show the most physically and psychologically damaging moments. Milligan claims she was held underwater repeatedly while Russ and the actors laughed at her and ignored her cries for help. This was before the safe word got issued, too. I've seen her video. Well, it also says your head will get held underwater yeah, and I we mean, will laugh at you and ignore your cries for help. She... That's why I didn't hold up in any kind of court. In the legal world, we call this, you done goofed. Don't sign the waiver. No. <laughs> Don't do this. If you sign the she, I think she's saying, or because I've watched several videos of her, mm-hmm. saying that what happened to her wasn't something she signed off on the waiver, mm. but they purposely edited that out of the video so people wouldn't know. I can't imagine what they would have done to her. I mean, it would have had to been full out. Yeah. Because on the waiver, it's like, we'll smash your hands with hammers. Like, I mean, it's not yeah. anything. 
I think she was got got in over her head. No yeah. pun intended. With her head being held underwater, she also has had really long hair, and she said her hair was wrapping around her neck and uh, choking her, yeah. and she started panicking. And she thought to herself, "I'm going to die. They're not going to let me leave. I'm going to die." And so many people yeah. that quit say, "I honestly thought I was going to die." And somebody's going to be the first. Yeah, somebody had a heart attack yeah. a couple years ago. A guy had a heart attack. Russ said it made for great footage. He's also really psychopathic because everything he does, he says he's doing it as entertainment purposes. He wants to get the right shot. It says that on the waiver. It says you understand you're part of a show and you're a participant in a show and entertainment in a show. Yeah. It seems as, it's not like I'm doing this as a psychological. He kind of sometimes in interviews makes it sound like he's this benevolent figure that's like i'm only charging a bag of dog food and i'm challenging you to your purse fuck you man you're you're making money somehow but also you are doing this for the this like filming purposes oh yeah he considers himself an entertainer he used to be a wedding singer <laughs> and a dj there's in the documentary there's lots of footage of him singing at weddings he's not bad but maybe that's part of the torture. <laughs> he just sings. Come fly with Journey me. Journey to you for yeah. three hours right. straight. Sweet but- <laughs> Caroline. You're like, no, <laughs> give me the eels. <laughs> but yeah, he considers himself an entertainer mm-hmm. and he, he makes these movies. They're, I mean, they're kind of, it's, they become redundant, yeah. but there's a lot. I mean, the scores are nice. <laughs> And they're edited together, kind of like Good he's, production value. he's looking at everything as production value. Yeah. Mm-hmm. While Milligan claims her experience was traumatic and left her emotionally and physically scarred, this contradicts her filmed exit interview of the manor, where she says she never felt like she was being held against her will and that she understood it was just a game created for her enjoyment. Milligan claims she gave this review only to ensure the manor would upload her video to YouTube in hopes of exposing McKamey Manor for what it truly is. Despite Milligan's efforts, ultimately no legal action can be taken due to the waiver she signed. Yeah, she's on film saying this was with, great with Russ saying, so you understand this was a game where this was all for your entertainment. She's like, yes, absolutely. I never felt threatened. I never felt like my life was in danger. I considered it a game the whole time. She's got a huge smile on her face. It might be one of those things where you're so you're kind of in shock, or maybe and you, you're just say anything to get the fuck out of there. True, you're like on an adrenaline high, like oh thank god I'm out. Yeah, and then afterwards you're like oh my god my life is ruined. Yeah, yeah. Once you, it all starts to sink in. Well, in addition to contestants' experiences being uploaded to YouTube, the waiver also states that footage will be live streamed to Las Vegas, Thailand, and the Philippines, where supposedly viewers watch and bet on how far the contestant will make it through the manor. Many wonder if kickbacks from this sinister gambling is how Russ bankrolls his operation. In The Haunt, The Art of the Scare, Russ claims to have spent upwards of half a million dollars on his horror experience over the past 14 years. In Episode 8 of Dark Tourist, David Ferrier repeatedly asks Russ if he makes any money off his haunt. Russ is adamant that he does not, and the only income he makes is the $800 a month check he gets from the Navy. This is a uh, suspicious, dis- like, uh, dis- I, it's I have to difference. imagine he's getting something from this gambling situation. You don't just go, mm, I'm going to buy a big-ass plot of land in Tennessee and move from San Diego to well, Tennessee. Well, he did move from San Diego because of expenses, because it's mm-hmm. so freaking expensive to live in San Diego. And he was, it's, they are just in a neighborhood like you and I live. That would be Imagine it. if your neighbor has this going on. And you see people with bags all the head time. Thing. Neighbors would call the cops all the time. The cops were always out there because they're like, some woman's getting dragged from a van with a bag over her head, kicking and screaming, and it just got tossed into this house. And they're like, yeah, that's, that's Russ. In the David Ferrier episode, he calls the police to, at the beginning to say, we're doing a show today, so if you get any calls, I just want y'all to know everything's on the up and up. That would be the perfect cover to murder people. Mm-hmm. That you would just be like, remember, we're just doing that movie, and you get two contestants, and then one of them you're really filming, and the other one you're really murdering. Ooh, that's a good, a scary that's a good one. That is. That's like Saw. Parents would show up at his house and say, my three-year-old 
can hear the screams that are coming out of your backyard at night and sees people with bags over their head getting dragged getting, around. Yeah, and they're like, "This is horrible for them. They shouldn't be seeing this." That's a nuisance. I mean, I would the neighbor could the Absolutely. neighborhood could collectively come together and sue him for basically like devaluing their property, and then they can't enjoy you. Like, I can't go have a backyard party if you're like, ah, yeah. God. There's just constant screaming coming from your neighbor's house. Yeah, he got the neighbors were not happy with him in San Diego. They that's why he tried to move to Illinois and he was basically told, nah, you're not going to do that here. And then bought this huge plot of land in Tennessee, which you can't see anybody for miles and miles. So I don't think he has any neighbors, but the residents are still they've contacted the county commissioner. They're trying to get him kicked out. Mm -hmm. They've they're all sorts of things have been filed against him. I wouldn't want this guy in my neighborhood. No, because I'm telling you, it's one slip away from him losing it and starting to kill people. I And also, I wouldn't want Ella to see anything like yeah. that. Or I can it. understand it's a game, but even I would be traumatized seeing something like this happen. Well, because you don't know. A child you, doesn't understand that. No, especially. And even, you know, just a person walking by, you're like, did they sign the waiver? Or even if they did, they sound, let me go, let me go. Like, yeah. Do they really want to get let go? Five years ago, a change.org position was created in part to end all illegal or questionable actions, including torture and illegal betting. The petition had 3,062 supporters. And while it is unclear if anything directly came of it, the manor has since issued safe words and increased the requirements for entry. So is what happens at McKamey Manor illegal torture or a violation of human rights? In short, no. Torture must be committed by someone acting under color of law meaning they represent the local, state, or federal government. So while Russ McCamey and his staff may be doing things that are harmful and violent and certainly torture-like, legally it is not torture, as he is not purporting to act as a government agent. The Convention Against Torture further defines torture as pain and punishment inflicted upon a person in order to gain information or punish that person at the instigation of or with the acquiescence of a public official. What one individual does to another is either criminal or a plain old tort. Yeah, it's torture is usually done by, if not like di- Guantanamo Bay stuff. Correctly, if not directly by the government, then in some uh, regimes where the government is aware that maybe a certain gang or a certain mafia is torturing people and then working in concert with the government and the government kind of goes, yeah, we know that those guys are torturing people, but they give us a lot of good information, so we're going to let them keep torturing Mm -hmm. it. Then you're sort of the government's acquiescing and letting them do that. But it all torture, and you know, like, oh my God, listen to that guy sing karaoke with torture. If you want to use it in a colloquial sense, yeah, but what he's doing is not legally torture because the question i mean would you say oh well the cops aren't stopping him or whatever but the cops aren't stopping him because he has these waivers yeah exactly but yeah it's not against when people say it's against human rights you sound like an idiot no offense but i mean you know, to people who are listening who think that it's you're just misusing and also frankly these are people who have this the f- sufficient funds and assets and state of mind and physical ability to go out there like when i represent asylum seekers because they've actually been tortured it's very offensive that's like i gave him a bag of dog food and he put my head underwater i was tortured it's like you went through a really bad thing but like Let's not throw around torture and human rights violations so loosely when it's... They're signing a waiver that they know exactly what they're getting into. That you walked up in your car and you weren't ripped from your bed in the middle of the night because no. of who you are and what you believe. You, Those wa- are two you different... wanted to do this. Correct. And even if you change your mind later, which we'll get into that, but this is this is not... Yeah, this isn't someone coming and yanking you out of your bed because you're a member of an ethnic group or a racial minority or religion or against the political party in power or LGBT status, yada, yada. Well, under criminal law, Russ McCamey may be committing assault. Under Tennessee law, assault is defined as intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly causing bodily harm to another, or intentionally or knowingly causing another to reasonably fear imminent bodily harm. A common defense to being charged with assault is consent, meaning the victim knew the behavior in which the perpetrator was going to engage and allowed it to happen, which is exactly what is happening here. Yeah, it's equivalent to being like, hey, we were doing a backyard wrestling match. And I knew we knew we were going to wrestle each other. And then the guy pushes you out of the ring and you're like, oh, you pushed me out of the ring. You assaulted me. Well, when the cops show up, they're like, we were doing a wrestling match. Like we knew we were this was mm-hmm. going to happen. Although Russ McCamey provides all of his victims with a 40 page waiver, if the actions and behaviors he engages in behind the scenes deviate too much from what is disclosed in the waiver, 
then he has not successfully obtained consent. This would be like if you're doing a backyard wrestling match and you're like, oh, no, this is a no weapons wrestling match. And someone pulls out a knife and stabs you in the gut. You're like, I did not consent to that. It goes well beyond the scope of what you've been. So reading this waiver and it's very long and like I said, very detailed. It's not just you may encounter bugs. It's like we will put your head in a box of wasps. We will put roaches in your mouth. We will feed you your own vomit. We'll feed you food. We will feed you. Uh, it said like edible food, which that's sort of a loose term. I mean, I think they could still feed you rotten food in theory because they they're feed not, people rotten food all the time. But they're feeding you food, not like poison. So if they said like right. we're going to feed you food and they pour actual Windex down your throat, that's deviant. You didn't consent to that. Right. Or if it says you will encounter bugs and other, you know, eels, but then there's actually a shark and you get eaten by a shark, then that's beyond the scope of what he's, uh, you know, what you've consented to. So if you're saying it, th- that's the problem with this, you know, this gal and other people, it says, well, I came home with bruises and bumps. It says in there, it doesn't say you may get bruises and it's, bumps. You will it says, leave with broken bones, bruises, scrapes, uh, sprains. It also has a lot of stuff that says you understand that you will be you will come in close contact with knives. And then if you panic and freak out, you may get yourself cut, which is kind of a get out of jail free card. But if they just came up and stabbed you in the ribs. And you're just sitting still. That's not in the waiver. Right. So I think that that would really be the only place he would get in trouble is if he sets out these 55 or it's like 125 things in the waiver that's going to happen to you, which I'll put it in the show notes. It's a it's weird. It's a YouTube video that just shows each page of the waiver for however long. And I wonder if it's like that, because it's if you publish it on a website, like you know what I mean? Like if they publish it on a website, it's got a non-disclosure, you'd like get in mm-hmm. trouble somehow. But anyway, mm-hmm. but. If it's something that's not one of those 125 things, that's when you would be able to press charges or sue him or whatever. But it's pretty informed consent. Pretty airtight. Yeah. Russ would also likely raise the defense of consent in any civil lawsuit regarding the ongoings at McKamey Manor. In addition to being criminally charged for assault, you can also sue someone for assault. The difference is what you have to prove. For criminal charges, you must prove the actions at issue occurred beyond a reasonable doubt. While at a civil trial, it must be proved that the actions at issue were more likely than not to have occurred. Since Russ McCamey allegedly films all incidents, it would not be difficult to prove whether actions occurred. Again, Russ would likely argue that his participants signed a waiver and were aware of the actions that were about to happen to them. But if his actions materially deviated from what he disclosed in the waiver, then he has not obtained informed consent, which is required to fully waive a future lawsuit. I think everything he does is covered in that damn waiver. It ha- I mean, it's so And people thorough. don't realize they uh, they sign this waiver and something in their brain is like, it's really not going to be this bad. And then they get in there and realize, oh, no, it definitely is this bad and want to get out. Understandable. But that's where it ends. You get out, you go home, you say, oh, that was a terrible decision I made. And then you don't ever go back. Yeah. It also, the waiver includes that it will, they'll cut your hair, they'll pull your teeth out, and that they will use MK Ultra mind control on you. And apparently they do. They use all sorts of psychological, psychological torture. weird mind control. And then it, so it's the waiver, then it's a release because it's very clear that you will be filmed, your image is going to be used, your image is going to be broadcast to multiple places. And that he has full rights and license to your image and to make money off of it and you have no rights to it. Then it has a non-disclosure, which is a 10-year term of a non-disclosure, and which means you can't t- talk about what happened. You can't release the waiver. So I don't know whose copy of this waiver is. It's blank, but they managed to upload a copy of it. And then uh, there's, a non- a, there's a non-disparagement part that says you can't talk negatively about Russ or McKamey Manor on social media, online for 20 years after you go through. And if you do, you're subject to a $50,000 liquidated damages provision. Well, hopefully in 20 years, social media isn't around. <laughs> if, if we're doing anything right. It's just going to be TikTok videos, baby. <laughs> just yeah. seven second videos of this torture people endure. To be clear, I don't think he would be able to enforce the liquidated damages of $50,000. But I, I don't know. That... I also don't think anyone can sue him. I don't think so. So and he may hold that up as to an unsophisticated party and say, look, you have this waiver, but if you try to sue me, the waiver is going to block your lawsuit. And then I'll try to I will come after you under this non-disparagement for 50 G's. And somebody say, well, you know, it's not really worth it. Get in this protracted. What we need is a really rich person to go through it. And then they sue him. I think there have been. Oh, well, then they done goofed. It's not all just (laughs) struggling people. The other question is. 
And the, the change.org petition brought it up was like, well, is he paying taxes if he's getting these gambling winnings? And if you're located in Tennessee, this is what is very boring legal jargon and extraterritorial jurisdiction of like, if you're in Tennessee, you're streaming something to Vegas and it's legal to bet in Vegas, but you're doing the betting and taking the money in Tennessee. Like, where are you operating? What are the rules of interstate commerce? Yada, yada. But that's a question for the IRS. And you know what? You get like, I think a 30% kickback if you call the IRS and rat somebody. So, we're just a phone call away from somebody ratting him out for tax evasion. You have to have actual I knowledge. I think uh, the IRS has been investigating him. Oh, well. So, or yeah, I wonder, like, the Tennessee authorities would investigate him for illegal gambling, these allegations of illegal gambling. Yeah, I think he's definitely streaming to, I mean, he doesn't even try to hide it to people that are betting on it. Yes. But the money is probably changing hands wherever people are betting. Yes. And he's getting a kickback from that. And maybe they pay him just a handsome fee for the streaming yes. feed. And he's like, oh, I'm not I'm not betting. I'm not making That's money. That's what I betting. think happens. I'm yeah. just making money streaming something, in which case you're like a porno website or like a cam girl yeah. or something. And who's to say that's illegal? Yep. Interesting. It is. Did oh, wait, wait, wait. Will they, won't they on McKamey Manor? Oh, no, God, no. Not in a million years. <laughs> of course not. No, no, no. And you? Absolutely. <laughs> no. Absolutely not. No. It doesn't... What they do there does nothing for me. No. It seems mean. I don't... I mean, it's very mean, but it's also just gross. I don't like yeah. gross stuff. I don't want to be touched. I don't want to walk in my backyard barefoot. Like, I don't... <laughs> I don't like dirt. I don't like things like... Gro- I don't like bugs at all. Gross. So, Yeah. No, thank you. (laughs) Last night, I was watching one of these videos in bed. So I was like you were when somebody came up behind you, and I was very on edge watching it. And I look over, and Tommy's just standing next to the bed, pointing at the where his pillow is. And I go, what? Is there a bug? And he goes, "What are you? What are you talking about?" I go, "You're pointing like there's a bug." And he's like, "That's not a way people point. What are you talking about?" (laughs) And because I'd been watching people being force fed bugs. He's like, I just wanted to know if you knew where my pillow was. I'm like, so there's not, not a bug. Can you, you need to confirm. <laughs> there's no roach over there where there should be a pillow. Yeah. It gets but, you, it gets you on edge. Man. I, yeah. I don't like bugs. Never have, never will. And just certainly don't want any shoved down my throat. Mm-mm. Ooh. Mm-mm. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. I've accidentally eaten bugs while riding the motorcycle and that was bad. Oh, enough. yeah. I mean, we've all. Eating some bugs and spiders. Don't they say Statistically, you eat eight spiders don't in your tell life. Me that's gross. They crawl. I thought mouth. it was eight spiders a year. Okay, in your life is oh, better. Well, well, that shit. That's a ton of spiders. If that's a year. That's a lot. So, what is it about the thrill of fear that propels individuals to subject themselves to such extreme situations? In an interview with Ranker, Christian Thor, co-curator of Blackout, says he wants patrons to ask themselves, Why is this effective? Why am I letting someone do this to me? Atlantic Magazine interviewed Dr. Margie Kerr, the staff sociologist at Pittsburgh-based haunt Scarehouse, and professor at Robert Morris University and Chatham University. According to Dr. Kerr, people love being scared because of a basic brain chemistry reaction. One of the main hormones released during scary and thrilling activities is dopamine, and it turns out some individuals may get more of a kick from this dopamine response than others do. Additionally, Dr. Kerr believes the sense of confidence we get from overcoming scary situations keeps folks coming back for more. Dr. Kerr explains that when a person makes it all the way through one of these events, much like after making it through a scary movie, they feel a sense of accomplishment, which she says can be a real self-esteem boost. I mean, it's true. You're you're you come out on the other side. It's like coming off of like I made it coming off a roller coaster. And you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I survived. It's definitely an adrenaline rush. Mm -hmm. You're on a high. You're safe. You feel a sense of um, camaraderie if you went through it. Because like Kenny Manor, you can go through by yourself. You can also go through with like two or three other people. So, yeah, it's like trauma bonding. Mm -hmm. Bragging rights. Yeah. According to Ranker, Melissa Marr of the Wall Street Journal believes the growing trend of extreme haunts is directly tied to the digital age in which we live. We live our lives staring at computer and cell phone screens, leaving us desperate for a more visceral experience in order to feel more alive. Fans of extreme haunts echo these sentiments for subjecting themselves to this special kind of torture. They want to discover their limits and push themselves further than they thought imaginable, and that they feel a sense of pride when they make it through the haunt. There are even those that report it helps them work through real-life issues of anxiety, depression, and sexual assault. There are also those that are acting out fantasies and fetishes in what they consider a safe and controlled environment. 
I mean, I get it. I've done an anger room when I was like particularly stressed in law oh, school. Oh, I would love to do an anger and room. And I smashed a computer keyboard and I was just like, book, you, law review, comment, I hate you. And afterwards, you really do feel a lot better. Yeah. It was very aggressive. You release that anger. Felt and so much better. Get that dopamine flowing. Mm-hmm. While the participants of the haunts have their reasons for taking part, so do the scare actors responsible for inflicting the physical and emotional torture. In an interview with The Guardian, Andrew Sweeney, former contestant of McKamey Manor, who now works as one of the scare actors at the haunt, says he uses the job as a way to take out a lot of personal pent-up aggression he carries around. I'm not going to lie. I go hard on the big guys. I got three kids, a lady, and six dogs. A lot going on in my life, and this is a great de-stressor. So this is where it gets a little questionable. You're beating people. Imagine and it's your wife. You've got people that they get off on doing this because it takes a certain individual to hold someone down, waterboard them, shove things into their mouth, have them begging for their lives, screaming, crying, and you're okay continuing to do this. And also laughing. Yeah. I mean, I could never be that person. You have to turn off your empathy center. Yeah, they it's it's a they get a kick out of it. It's a dangerous game. In that same interview, Ryan Lawrence, also a former contestant who now inflicts the same pain on people that he endured, said, "I'm the enforcer. I'm here to make sure no one makes it out. I get carried away. I don't really have a line." Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. That's the person that you've trusted your life to. Also, the guy that I talked about earlier that said, "I'm dying. I think I've I died." Mm-hmm. He works there now. So does his brother. <laughs> After a couple months after they went through it, they went to work for him. Wow. Uh, Another one, a woman was going through, and once she was over, still covered in the fake blood and everything, still in the middle of it, it had stopped. She said, if you ever need someone, if you ever need an actor, let me know. I'd I'd love to do this. And they're like, why would you want to do this? And she's like, because I want to hurt people. And then she stops herself. She's like, I mean... I want to scare people this bad. You want to hurt people. I mean, just like that guy that came out of blackout saying I was able to do things in there that would end my marriage and put me in jail. These people are able to do things that in any other situation you would be sued or arrested. Absolutely. You would be in jail for assault. And they're I don't even think they get paid. They're volunteers. But they're getting something out of it. They're getting some Ain't enjoyment. Free. That's <laughs> you getting paid somehow. Your cookies. Well, as it turns out, all the McCamey Manor actors are former contestants. Almost unanimously, they all came back as actors to know what it feels like to inflict that sort of pain and terror on someone else. Other scare actors agree with this motivation. Just like the patrons find a thrill being scared, those doing the scaring also experience stimulation and gratification. Whether you're into extreme haunted houses, regular haunted houses, or bobbing for apples is more your speed, we wish you a very safe and happy Halloween this year. Yeah. So what do we think? (laughs) Dude, well, it's interesting that that lady would say that, like, oh, I want to scare someone. And I wonder if inflicting this stuff on people at any of across any of these three probably particularly at McKamey Manor because it is a little bit more no well not a little bit it's very much no holds barred kind of thing if you as the actor are reclaiming like a sense of power that you don't have in your life it's almost like kind of like BDSM kind of stuff Mm -hmm. and who's to say if everybody is down with what's happening if that's wrong the problem I think my other question that I have for uh, and I think that's why it's important, like legally, that they have a safe word at McKamey Manor is the concept of withdrawing consent. That if you say, oh, I'm really cool to do this backyard wrestling match. And if someone's on top of you, like pum- pummeling your face and you say, stop, stop, stop. I want to stop. Then, you you know, you, yeah, you consented to be in the participate in this game, but then you've withdrawn your consent. Yeah, I, it's shocking to me that they didn't have a safe word for the majority of the time they've yeah. been operating and that people we're okay with that. I also watched a video of a guy that's a pro haunter, which is a thing, and he owns a his own and runs his own haunted house. Go through and on the videos before he goes through, he is just so confident that they can do anything they want. I don't care. I don't have any off limits. Russ asks him on camera, do you want a safe word? Nope. No safe word. I don't want it. And he's like, well, you, you have to have one. I'm going to give you one. Okay. 
Yeah, and, see, and I, I bet it's because withdrawal yeah, consent. Because yes. the question becomes like, where's the line? Yeah. Of like, I want to. I think I'm going to die. Let me out. And it's like, oh well, he. Well, and they've been under really so much it. fire for when they didn't have one, and people were begging for their lives. They would say no, yeah, and pe- force people to keep going for hours. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until Russ, not a trained doctor or psychologist, decided, okay, they've had enough. Yeah, how can someone on the outside that is rooting for you to keep going understand? That you've had enough. And also panic attacks did not count as a reason Correct. for him to that, stop it. It says that in the waiver. If yeah. you have a panic attack, we won't stop. And panic attacks can make you feel like you're dying. For sure. I have had them. They're, it, so that to me, I, I would never go through McKamey Manor at all. I 150% would have never gone through without a safe word because a, if I was having a panic attack and couldn't get out of a situation... That would be uh, it would end all. You everything. may lose consciousness. I yeah. mean, you never people know. People do. They black out because their bodies can't take it anymore. Jeez, man. It's wild. It is wild. So I don't know if I would go through any of these. No. My other favorite thing in the waiver is that it said, if you're a policeman, you have to tell us, which is like not a thing. <laughs> it was like, you are representing and that you are not a policeman. On Why would under- it matter? Undercover sting. Great question. Oh, like a sting? Yeah. like Not the- just because they want to go through as a Yeah, no, it said like you're not a sting and you're not doing an investigation. But I'm like, you, they can lie to you. <laughs> You don't. They can sign that stuff. Yeah, you don't. I don't I think, think they're you're, above your waiver. I don't think that. I don't know your waiver that's riddled with spell, spelling errors <laughs> that he clearly wrote himself. He typed it on. I imagine he he's got lawyers on, though. On Microsoft works. <laughs> it's just old. <laughs> yeah, I mean, surely. I'm, I guess. Yeah. Well, a lot of people in that haunt of the scare. For, most other extreme haunters are, you know, um, people that do them out of their home and stuff like that are not fans of Russ McCamey and they want him gone and they think oh, they think that he's like meth- mucking up the yeah and that he's what he does is they just call it torture and yeah. they also think that eventually someone's going to die there yeah and then there's going to be all these I think legal so. uh things slapped on everybody and that will basically shut down like the amateur haunters that are trying to go pro I'm wondering and I, I would have to look into it at least just for Texas I'm sure well that they're subject to that you would be subject to standards you know what i mean like any business you can't just go i'm gonna have an ice cream shop in my house and you're like no if you're gonna run an ice cream shop zoned for it yeah like you would have you'd have zoning laws as far as where you could operate and then inside of it you would have some kind of safety laws you would have you know like a regular haunted like osha yeah like there's osha standards like ocean standard. like, yeah i don't know if you That's go to a, a haunted question. house in dallas the exits are clearly marked for yeah. like fire purposes or issues so maybe he gets around it by saying but you're not signing waivers when you go into those either true and, I, and you may say he may argue i'm not running a business that's open to the public i'm doing individualized filming yeah and he also handpicks people just because you sign up does not mean correct put your name on the list does not mean you're going to get accepted so yeah, maybe it's because it's, it's not open to the public, and it's, and it's not open to the public, and he yeah. doesn't charge as an admission fee, so it's not a business. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. myself out of why it's not. I'm trying to. I'm trying to represent. I Russ mean, me. Yeah, <laughs> he'd probably love that. This is what law school does to your brain, though. You see something that's abhorrent, and you go, "This is terrible," and you go, "How could I help this person?" Though <laughs> they all they have rights. Too. I think he's doing okay. I don't know if he needs yeah, help, well, but maybe he just needs spell check, but. Well, if you've been through any extreme haunt, I would love to please, hear about it. Please DM us. Especially Email. McKamey Manor, or I mean, really any of them. But I would love to hear firsthand from someone that went through one of these what your experience was like. Agreed. Please DM us or send us an email. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Well, we have a live show with our improv troupe, The Cult, coming up this week, November 2nd at 10 p.m. at Dallas Comedy House. And you can go to Sinisterhood.com and click on live shows and you will get the information of uh, tickets and directions and all that good stuff. Absolutely. Sinisterhood will always remain free. But if you wish to donate to our Patreon to help offset the cost of making and hosting the show, you can visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Patreon in the top right corner. You'll get some sweet perks like Patreon-exclusive content, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, 
a special shout out on the show, and a monthly bonus mini so. And make sure to stick around after our sign offs to hear your shout out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. We love them. If you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on shop in the top right corner. And a limited time only, you get 20% off of your entire order when you spend 15% or more now through Halloween. So get in there. If you're listening to this on Wednesday on the drop day or on Halloween till midnight, you have a chance. But even if you're listening to this later on, you can go get some dope stuff on there. I think it's reasonably priced. Absolutely. Absent the 20% off. And uh, send us pictures of you wearing it. We had some great Sinisterhood fans this weekend at the party dressed up in our... <laughs> yes. Christy has the black Sinisterhood logo. And Heather has the... I talked about myself in the third person. Heather has the <laughs> Heather Gray Navy Keep It Creepy with the Devil Rules the Airways on the back. So head to Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop in the top right corner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts and tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at on the computer? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I am on Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram and TikTok at Heather versus the oh, world. Jesus, we've added TikTok. <laughs> oh, yeah. As always, the devil rules the airways. And keep it creepy. Mwah. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your Patreon shoutouts. Anna Beth Gruber. Samantha Hersher. Amanda Hook. Lainey Goodman. Whitney Torres. Mandalay Wolschlager. Ellen Vander Hayden. Rebecca Shartow. Jesse. Cameron Tips. Alexis Schaefer. Annette Owens. Asha Zappa. Nicole Partridge. Mandy Bennington. Rebecca Gibson. Jen Bennett. Tracy Peshek. Haley Archuleta. And Andy Keeler. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We could not do it without you. Keep your eye out in the mail for your Sinisterhood sticker. And until then, we appreciate you. Yes, and we will be posting the video footage of our live show momentarily. So keep your eyes out for that as well. Thank you so much. Keep it creepy. Sinisterhood.